Chapter 26, Secrets and Lies Secrets and Lies Night had fallen quickly over the plains, the stars dusting that field of black as night sky crept lower and darkness swallowed all but their ring of wagons and the large campfire within. Imoan glanced back to the group she had just left, half hidden in the shadows of her jit's caravan. Fritha had found Javaj and Badal soon enough, the girls joining them and a few of the other hands after the evening meal to talk and flirt over a couple of bottles of their father's apricot liqueur, Fritha wielding that fan as a dualist handled a blade, looks parried and smiles guarded with a skill that would have brought a confirmed rake to his knees. Entertaining though it was to watch her, the men were steadily falling back into Alzito as the alcohol flowed, and Imoan was too tired to concentrate on translating just then. Besides, livelier though that company was, it lacked a certain something she had been glad to grow used to, that familiar arm closing about her as she settled next to Valigar, the man sat in a small knot with Minsk and Solafane playing a listless hand of cards. Ah, I'm glad I left when I did, that liqueur has gone straight to my head. Young Fritha did not decide to return as well, asked Minsk, Bulus before him his roving kept in check by the pen of legs, the ranger's frown sent across the camp at another peal of laughter as though he would have liked to corral her friend similarly. Nah, not yet, Imoen chirruped, eager tongue enjoying the lasting sweetness on her lips, I can't imagine she'll be long though. A lie, but one that served them all well, Minsk going back to his cards, and Imoen watched the round play out in the crook of Valigar's arm the camp feeling rather empty for their much-increased company. A no-man had stayed only long enough to eat dinner before he had walked off into darkness to make his prayers and he had not returned since. Imoan let her drooping eyes travel to those left in an effort to keep them open. Their own knot was far enough from the campfire to let the cool breeze temper its heat, the warmth as intoxicating as the liqueur she had left. Herjit and the few older men of the caravan were sat on the other side of the fire talking amongst themselves, the merchant noticing her watching to send her a smile and a nod that she returned, the smile lingering as she turned back to her own group, Solafane laying the winning hand onto the grass before him to universal indifference. So, a no man's still off praying, Imoen began, drawing a deep breath and letting the heavy smell of wood smoke rouse her, where's Brianna? She said something about getting some sleep and has already retired, answered Solafane, the man gathering up the cards, though he made no move to deal another round. She seemed displeased. Shar's moping face, is everyone in a mood this evening? Well, nearly everyone. Imoen conceded as Fritha's laughter drifted over to them. Solafane glanced to the noise with a mild frown. The day has been a long one, Minsk offered, and this heat saps strength from the spirit, leaving the soul open to shadow. But not you, eh, Minsk? Imoen teased, hoping to see that usual broad smile, but the ranger just shrugged, gaze on his knees as he fed Boo a corner of cracker he had drawn from his pocket. No, but there is a sadness which falls over all hearts in the quieter moments of the evening for those who are far from their homelands. Ah, how I long for the snowfields! Imoen sighed, perhaps she had left Fritha too soon. It must be strange being so far from home. Does such not apply to all of us? asked Solafane. Imoen shrugged. Not in the same way. The heartlands are much the same as here, only cooler. And as for Candle Keep, it was my home for when I was there, but it's not the sort of place you can miss, I guess I miss the people more than anything. What about you, Sola? She teased, glad to move on from this so far depressing subject, missing the underdark. I can boss you about for a bit if you're feeling homesick. She watched his lips twist in that wry smile. I thank you for the offer but being subject to another's whims is one thing I do not miss. As to your question, there are things I remember fondly, not least the fair. 
The food here is quite different to what I would have eaten in Ustnatha. Elaborate banquets were but another way to show one's power in that city. I did not pay much attention to the usual delicacies of the table, but there was a dish, roth oil k, made from the liver of the roth a calf which has been pickled the same beast's milk and pressed in the jelly from its hoofs to make a kind of jam. He trailed off at the revolted silence, well, no doubt it would not be to all tastes. Well, reasoned Imoen, I can't say I'll be asking for it at the next tavern we reach, but I haven't been anywhere yet that didn't have some sort of strange local dish to offer the unsuspecting foreigners. Indeed, added Valigar, the Ithcatlan delicacy is fried octopuses. The drow frowned. Octopuses, you mean? Yeah, nodded Imoen, clawing a hand and wiggling the fingers like tentacles, those things that look like seaborne illithid heads. They catch them young and fry them whole, Valigar elaborated, though the cheaper variants merely use chopped octopus or even squid. Now it was Solafane's turn to look repulsed and Imoen laughed brightly. See, it's the same everywhere. What do they eat in Rashomon, Minsk? Hmm, many things, though for your talk, I am thinking of Svid. Boiled ram's head, where tongue, jaw, and eye all may be eaten, though I have never had a taste for it. The eyes! cried Imoen, gah! I think I'd rather have that rothe thing. A round of chuckling, Solafane turning a smile upon the girl. And what of your home, Imoen? That's easy, black pudding. Black pudding, repeated the drow, clearly thinking of the small black oozes that populated his former home. Yeah, it's a type of sausage made from pig's blood. Pig's blood. Imoen just nodded at his disgusted look. It's very nice. What of you, good Valigar, laughed Minsk, the man seeming cheered by this talk. Do you miss your estate? Young Mab's cooking would be enough to tempt back many men. And who's this young Mab? Questioned Imoen promptly. Valigar's arm tightened about her in unspoken reassurance. The housekeeper at my estate. And no, Minsk, I cannot say I miss the place, Mab's skills in the kitchen, or not. My home was ever changing as I traveled. Perhaps when I finally return to Ithkatla, I will spend enough time there to form a bond with the place that others speak of, but I do not feel such now. If we return, muttered Solafane darkly. Imoen snorted. Oh, come on, Sola, don't feel you have to take up the role of the doomsayer just cause Val's in a good mood for once. Forgive me. I am just keenly aware of what we face here. Armies and dragons, not all of us may see this through to the end. Which is why we're going to need something to look forward to, pressed Imoen. What are your plans when we finally leave here? I do not know. When we were young, Fritha used to go on and on about traveling the plains, you could go with her. The drow did not share her smile. Perhaps. Well, offered Valigar, whatever may come, you will be welcome at my home. Solafane nodded his thanks, but said no more, the silence prompting Minsk to question, and what of young Imoen, will you, too, return to Ithkatla? Me? I suppose at first though I've been meaning to get back to the studies I started in Suldana Cellar. I might head west, I hear there's this whole country of wizards beyond the Sea of Fallen Stars. Valigar was frowning deeply and Minsk didn't look much better. Joke, just a joke, sighed Imoen, she had definitely left Fritha too soon. The Red Scourge should not be spoken of in jest, young Imoen for they bring great evil to this land. Yeah, all right, she sighed crossly, 
but if I can have a laugh about Ball coming down here and spawning me as one of his baseborn progeny, then I can have a laugh about anyone. Ah, I might call it a night. She continued, more than done with their megrims. Sleep well, you lot. She disengaged herself from Valigar, slightly more sharply than she had intended, making to her feet and surprised to find the man following suit, though she did not wait for him, the girl only a few paces from her tent when he caught her. You go to sleep in with Brianna? No, Vals, I thought I'd go and kip in with her jits horses. Course, I'm in with Brianna, where else would I be? Valigar frowned, a usual enough gesture from him, though even for that he seemed uncharacteristically flustered, the man glancing to her only to look away again, seemingly very interested in the fire they had just left. I merely wondered if you would like to share a tent with me tonight. Minsk can sleep in with a no-man, when the man returns. Imoen felt the grin tug her stomach unreasonably fluttery considering how they had spent the previous evening. Yeah, all right, I'd like that. Valigar was smiling once more, any reply cut off by another peal of laughter behind them, Jivaj up and topping up cups as Badal fetched out his flute, one of the other men already on his feet and offering to retrieve Fritha's loot case, the girl catching her eye to call across to them. Imoen, Valigar, come join us. Imoen turned back to Valigar with a smile, reaching out to give his sleeve an encouraging tug towards his tent. For all her friend's unspoken promises of an evening spent in laughter, just then, there was nowhere else she wished to be. It looks like a cloud. Fritha drew a terse breath, her shoulders aching from where they were pressing into the hard, cold tiles. Pain, she may as well get used to it considering the hangover she was going to wake up to. Saravak, I've told you, this isn't how you play the game. You have to use your imagination. Now tell me what you see. This is pointless, snapped the body next to her. Fritha ignored him. It is not pointless. You have to say what you think they look like, other than clouds. It provides a window into your mind. And why would you wish that? Because I am trying to see how far the essence influences us. Would all Ballspawn see similar things? We both have, or in your case had, much of the blood within us. Does it influence our outlook? I want to know. Look there! She cried, hand thrown up to the churning green tempest far above them, that one looks like a dragon, a pause as wings were whipped into ears, or maybe a rabbit. Your turn! Saravak sighed deeply, pointing to a large cloud front sweeping in from the west, boiling in the changing pressures like lumpy porridge. There! That one looks like a field of slaughtered ballspawn with me standing over it in victory awaiting to ascend my father's throne. Fritha snorted very funny, you know you wouldn't have made a half-bad god of murder. Shame you hadn't the power to take the throne. The man was bolt upright in a heartbeat, the shelter he had provided gone and the wind was suddenly tearing at them both. I would rather lack the power than the will. You would waste all the fates have seen to gift you. Fritha just smiled, letting fingernails pointedly tap tiles next to her and, with a disgruntled snort, he lay back down. We'll be arriving in Amkathran in a few days. Amkathran, the place where that interfering witch. I think she prefers Melison is trying to gather the remaining ball spawn. Fritha could hear the narrowed eyes. Do not trust her, sister, no one embroils themselves with the children of the curse without another motive. Fritha sighed her frustrations to the sky. Yes, but what is it? She says she wishes to avoid Ball's resurrection, but is that all? 
not wanting to sound awful, but he's hardly likely to have singled some noble women out for his ire even if he came back. Why does she care? And you do not believe she is a Valspawn? She says not and I didn't sense that in her when we met. Saravak rumbled a bitter laugh. Perhaps she just wants to help. But why? Continued Fritha, expecting no revelation even as she pressed the question, what link does she have to this mess that would make her want to try and resolve it? Or did she just wake up one day and suddenly decide, I know, I'm going to help the children and save Tether. Perhaps this just shows how far I've fallen, but no one is that altruistic. Not even you, sister. Fritha laughed. Especially not me. You were right before. I was dragging myself to the throne and how I resented every step. But not now, the throne is my goal and nothing will stop me. And yes, perhaps I'll die at the taking or even before, but you were right about that, too. Everyone dies, and this way I won't suffer some ignoble end from sickness or age. I will die trying to help a lot of people, there are worse ways to go. Don't get me wrong. I'd much rather just carry on as I am, and I really don't want to become Ball, but the slim chance I won't is worth the struggle, and I could do much good as a god, spare the other children, help my friends. If have to fight for anything, I will fight for that. A pause between them, Saravak's voice finally coming quiet and free from the contempt she had anticipated. I do not know if it will get you there, sister but for one such as you. I do not imagine you could aim for higher. Fritha just smiled, gazed back to the sky. You look, that one looks like a butterfly. The breeze was hot and sultry, though nothing with which he was completely unfamiliar, those days that found them in the lowlands of Om during high summer much the same. The breath of the storm. Songita had called it, and Valigar scanned the horizon, hardly believing that rain clouds were not gathering when such moisture hung in the air to smother breath and thought. But the sky was that same glaring blue it had been since they had left Indraviat, and it seemed more than he was tired of it by the way the others trudged after the caravan, Imo and a few paces behind him with Solafane, while Minsk walked at Brianna's side at their rear, the warrior talking to her with his usual animation despite the heat. Valigar finding camaraderie in a no-man's company, both of them silent as they considered their own thoughts. It had been pleasant sharing a tent with Imoen, nicer, in fact, that sharing a bed, cramped together in the shared heat of their union. He preferred space about him when he slept, but it was pleasing all the same, feeling that small presence curled at his back, only to wake to enjoy a few moments together in the morning's peace before they were forced to rise and face the day. But for all that, their talks of magic still not at him, as did his difficulty marrying up the person Imoen was and the powers she held so carelessly at her command. He had told her he trusted her, and he did, but it did not assuage his own fears, not completely, the thoughts leaving him feeling strangely guilty, as though even dwelling on such worries meant he was playing the girl false. At his side, a no-man breathed a weary sigh, drawing a sleeve across his brow. This heat feels endless, I know the summers were warm in Om, but it was not like this, every day scorched under the same baking sun. Valigar understood his discomfort, heavy leathers pressing the slick tunic to his back, though he tried to keep his mind from it. I wonder if the weather is this fine back home, Nentat, our seneschal was hoping for a good crop of almonds from the southern holding this year. Indeed, sighed a noman, I suppose I should consider the same. I had hoped for a decent crop from the vineyard this year. Last year the season was too wet, though it hardly mattered then, as far as I can tell, my father has been its only client for quite some time. A vineyard? I imagine such would make you very popular with some. Valigar had meant it in jest, something to divert him, 
but a no-man merely frowned at the curled form in the back of the wagon a few paces before them. Fritha had spent her evening with her Jit's sons, helping to lighten their cargo by a couple of bottles of liqueur, and the was girl suffering for it today, a mere hour after attempting to continue with the caravan on foot finding her nestled upon a bed of cloaks in the back of the lead wagon, hat over her face and sleeping her hangover away. A no-man snorted. May she enjoy such while she can, she will be bowed under her pack again soon enough. Something the knight was apparently looking forward to considering the relish with which he announced her pending toil, another scowl thrown to the card for good measure. Fritha sighed in her sleep, oblivious to all. So, you have placed your estate under a seneschal to manage the venture? Continued Valigar. No, but the vineyard itself is run by Master Kyan, a good man who has long been in our service and lives there with his family. I recall I would sometimes play with his son, Daryl, when we spent the summers there, before the boy left for the army, he was a few years older than me. It has been years since I have seen any of them. A no man's frown had taken on a thoughtful air, the man lost a moment in the memories before a sigh brought him back. Perhaps I will seek out Llewellyn on my return to Amkathran, he was seneschal for my father and the reason, I suspect, there was anything of the estate still left to inherit. Or perhaps I can take up the task myself. You would run your estate? Confirmed Valigar, I would have thought the demands of life within the order would make such an impossibility. A no man cleared his throat, turning to take up his flask. Perhaps though I understand a few of the lords managed to find the time for both. Valigar merely nodded, wondering if he would ever feel ready to settle in that steady life, despite his promise to himself. It is a strange thing to think on, is it not? Others see the trappings of estate and title as a blessing, but it is grave responsibility, as well. All the work of those who came before now rests with you, to build upon what they begun or lead it to its ruin. The knight snorted. I am merely thankful there was any of it left after my father's guiding hand. Indeed, Valigar agreed, hoping to move on from this sore subject, and something to consider in our future plans. We will be arrived at the desert in another day, then we have but two days travel east to Amkathran. And then what? The knight sighed. We merely fight whomever this Melison directs us? And how are we to find this Abajizel? Valigar was surprised. You have doubts as to our course? No, no, a no man dismissed tiredly, but I merely wish we knew more in this than what we are told by one self proclaimed guardian. I feel blind, we have had contact with both the Silver Chalice and Harpers yet no one seems to know anything outside of scaremongering and rumors. I do not like marching into battle with the feeling another army could be amassing unseen at our backs. It is a concern, but we can only fight the battles presented to us. Take heart, many other groups are involved and wary, as you say, if other dangers should arise, we will not be alone to tackle, ah. His shout made more than just a no-man whirl to him though Valigar already knew his attacker by her battle cry. Vals He tried to turn in her embrace, Imoan dancing back after a quick squeeze to rejoin Solafane, the drow stood just behind her in passive contrast. And why am I being so accosted? The girl grinned, verdant eyes sparkling in the way that never failed to make him smile. Well. I was just chatting with Sola here, and he seemed to think you both looked a bit serious, so thought to come and sort that out, I don't want you sat in a mard all evening. I would not dare, he chuckled, leaning down to oblige her raised face with a kiss, and feeling strangely liberated as he realized he did not care whether those about them saw or not. It would seem your efforts have raised the spirits of more than just the ranger, Imoen. Solafane offered with a smile, nodding to the back of the wagon where Fritha was now sat, scrubbing at her face and stretching lithely, 
Imoen bounding over to close the few paces between them. Fritha! Feeling better? Yes, much, she faltered, hiding the yawn behind her hat's brim. Imoen laughed, nodding to the wagon that juddered and swayed over the uneven road. I'm surprised you could even sleep in there. This morning I could have fallen asleep on a clothesline. What time did you get to bed? Fritha pulled a face, clearly at a loss. Err. You arrived in our tent just after I came off the second watch, provided Sola Fane. Fritha nodded. A little after midnight then. Valigar felt the smile threaten, Imoen was a bad influence on him. And what were you doing so late into the night? Fritha's grin was unmistakable. Practicing my Alzido. Indeed, agreed Sola Fane, you wouldn't speak a word of anything else when you came to bed, though you apparently had much to tell me. Laughter, Fritha flushing marvelously and pretending to wear a pout even as she giggled along with them, the girl leaning forward to catch up the end of the long white tress that hung over the drow's shoulder and lightly tickled his face in playful admonishment. Practice makes perfect, Sola Fane by. Practice! cried Imoen, I know one thing that doesn't need any practice, where did you learn to flirt like that? Fritha threw back her head for a warm swell of delighted laughter. Imoen had a point. Nowhere, I can only assume it is natural talent. Fritha stretched again, removing the wooden pins to shake out her hair. Gods, I'm thirsty. I emptied my flask at dawn. She mimed feverishly gulping something back and laughed. Here, came a no man next to him thrusting his flask out at her with a frown, but the girl waved a hand before her in prompt refusal. No, no, I know our water is rationed and you're only offering it to me so you have more rights to your disapproval, I would rather suffer by my own hand, than yours. A no man colored, Valigar feeling the tension over them, though the night just rained back his temper to a cool rebuke. Then I can only hope this experience will impart to you the folly of such excesses. Fritha shrugged, setting her hat neatly on her heat. Indulgence brings its losses, but nothing comes from abstinence either. Perhaps you can just attempt a little temperance, then, Valigar offered mildly to their escalating argument. The girl grinned. I will try, Valigar but I can make you no promises. Ale, Perina Divat. All heads whipped to the shout, the wagon they were walking behind coming to a halt, those behind them following suit. What did he say? Pressed Imoen. Valigar had understood, though he left a no man to answer her, the ranger taking a step to the edge of the wagon and down the road he could see them a dozen horses and their lightly armored riders, likely the same group who had left the tracks he had found the day before, one bearing a familiar blue and silver standard. It is a company from the Silver Chalice. A no-man looked suddenly stiff, Fritha the same as her gaze fell on Sola Fane, clearly recalling what the knight had recounted to them in more detail the other morning, of the Balspawn Dragon Mistress and her army of barbarians and drow. Sola Fane, up here, Fritha urged, dropping down to make room for him, the drow springing up into the wagon at her word to conceal himself in amongst the crates and sacks, while the rest of them moved slowly to the side of the wagon for a better view. What is happening? muttered Minsk, he and Brianna ambling over to join them. Imoen shrugged. Nothing, we hope. At the front of the wagon, Herjit had fixed a welcoming smile upon his face, last instructions muttered to the youths at his side, though he seemed to relax somewhat as the knights drew up their horses before him, the lead man wearing an open-faced helm which revealed a young, 
amiable face of a similar countenance to the merchant's own sons. Namaste and good day, friends, might we inquire as to your destination? Why, indeed, Harjit called back with well-rehearsed cheer, we are bound to Kalimport, is there some trouble we should know of on the road ahead? No, and we are intending to keep it so. There are rumors circulating that a number of Balspawn are heading south, possibly to join an army amassing somewhere in the Kalim Desert. Those we have already detained have denied this, but we are charged with patrolling the roads for more. Well, as you can see, we are but simple merchants with the cargo to prove our undertaking. Understood, the knight confirmed, a nod sent to their ragtag grouping, and these with you. They. The merchant answered, turning back in his seat only to pause. Fritha was staring at him, her gaze black and resolute. Herjit returned to the knight with an easy smile. Why, we hired them as guards back in Indraviat, for all the good they would do, hanging back their gossiping like weavers. By Joaquin, I will crop your pay if I must tell you again, spread out along the caravan. I, you heard the man, sighed Fritha shooing at them as her jit and the knight made their farewells, and the caravan was once more rumbling southward as the knight continued north, Fritha quickening her pace to their head, his younger son, Javaj, glancing down at her with an eager smile, though she was not there for him. Thank you for that, her jit. The merchant accepted her gratitude with a broad smile. No matter, no matter. These northerners do not understand of what they speak. The Kalim Desert is a desolate mistress who kills all but the most wary. An army of men amassing within, H.A. She would not sustain an army of sand rats. Besides, I would hardly allow them to take my guards, would I? He chuckled, sending a friendly wink to Imoen. Fritha merely snorted. There is no army of Balspawn to the south and even if there were, merchants would not be their target. Herjit nodded, raising his hand to forestall any more. Indeed, but best we speak of this no further. I am skilled enough with falsehoods, but sometimes it is better to truly know nothing. They rolled on for a few more miles, Fritha walking with them for the last hour or so, though a no man noticed she did not engage him directly the girl between Imoen and the drow as they considered where these unlucky Balspawn were being detained. All seemed to have more faith in the silver chalice, at least, were treating them better than Tetheran army had seen fit, such talk holding them until the dusk drew in and the caravans grouped on the plains at the road's edge to prepare camp for the night. A no man sank to his knees, pitching his tent a little way from the bustle of the wagons and glad of the brief solitude the man taking his frustrations out on the tent pegs as he hammered them into the dry ground. So it was for this he had come south, for this he had been expelled from the order, nights spent watching her flirt with seemingly anyone who was willing, and days suffering her unrepentant cheek. Something made all the worse by those few moments they would find alone together, where they would fall into the easy camaraderie they had once used to enjoy, and it was almost as though nothing had changed between them. A no man sighed, trying to remind himself he had followed them there because he had believed it was where he was needed. And he still believed that, it was merely, did she have to make everything so hard? Valigar, have you seen Solafane? Oh, how the fates mocked him. Ah, Fritha faltered as a no man's frowning visage appeared over the canvas peak, I was looking for, isn't this Valigar's tent? No, a no man huffed, crouched, and back to his hammering, not that you were about to mark the change last night, but he shares a tent with Imoen now. I share with Minsk, though Brianna has taken, Besheva's horns. A no man, be careful. She cried, suddenly dropped to his side, her handkerchief unfurled and clamped over his bloody fingers. A no man threw down the offending mallet with force enough to divot the earth beside him. It's fine. He snapped, wanting to snatch his hand back, but he just couldn't bear to, 
the girl gently cleaning the blood away to find the wound. Look, you've taken the skin from your knuckle. You need to take more care with yourself, Anomen, we have enough threats from other quarters without us being a danger to ourselves. Well. She sighed, easing herself back onto her haunches, her handkerchief left with him, tied loosely about his hand. I'd best get back to it. I'm supposed to be helping Solophane and Brianna collect brush for the fires. It might be hot down here in the daytime, but it surely makes up for it once the sun sets. Indeed, a no man agreed coolly, attention returned to the pegs, a man could get tired of these brisk changes in temperature. He expected an embarrassed laugh or even a frown. But the girl just sighed and he glanced back to find her staring at him with an almost wistful look. So subtle. A no man, you are so different from the brash young man I first met. I hope you can find someone who appreciates the change as much as I. A no man swallowed, forcing the words that would bring an end to this uncertainty. I do not want someone, I want you. Her throat bobbed, face taking on a painfully pitying look. But I don't want you. A no man. She cried, her handkerchief torn from his hand. No, do not speak. A no man, I'm sorry, she pressed, stumbling to her feet as he rose too, but I thought I had been clear. I asked you when you first arrived, you swore you weren't here because of me. You knew I was lying. That's not the point. Anomen, you are my friend. Do not you dare. He roared, the Fritha dancing back at his fury as though frightened he would strike her. Do not you dare try to excuse what is between as merely my misconstruing your overtures of friendship. When I first rejoined this group, I swore I would put all between us aside. Even as I tore myself apart with worry for you in that camp, I remained firm that my relation to you would remain one of protector. But then on that morning after you returned to us, and we kissed. You kissed me. She cried, what was I supposed to do? Slap your face and cry go to. No, but you could have made it clear afterwards, if you had wished it. But you did not. You let me believe there was some chance. You are just as bad. You knew what it meant to come down here, what you were risking, you said you came for duty and now you're getting all angry because you came because of a regard that isn't returned. Not returned. He gasped, staggering back, words leaving him reeling. Even you are not so cruel as to pretend you did not realize what you were doing taking pleasure in my attentions one moment, only to shy from me the next. I will stand for this no longer. He took a stride towards her, meaning to take her shoulders, though she scooted back another step. Tell me now, Fritha, where is your heart? A no man, she pleaded, her tone telling him all he needed, anger and frustrations all ebbed away to that churning hollow emptiness, the girl continuing even as he turned from her. A no man, I care for you as my friend, but any more. Things are different now. We are different. No, no more, he cut in quietly, I cannot tell the lies from the truths any more. And Fritha just stood watching as his form was swallowed by the dusk, too stunned even to cry, the numbness stirred by that presence behind her. You heard. She glanced back in time to see the brisk nod, Solophane's face stony mask. Solophane, could you? I am going, he snapped, already stalking past her. I hope your secret is worth the pain it is causing. Do not you judge me. She yelled after him, the man whipping back with an anger she had never before seen directed at her. Why, Fritha? Because of what will come? Any one of us could die getting there. Yes, but I'm going to. 
Yes, you are, and when are you going to face it? I have. No, he pressed, manner suddenly quiet once more as he made a step back towards her. You have not. And you will not, not until you have told the others and watched their faces fall in that way you dread. I must go. He cut in, before she could choke out any reply, the man marching off in the direction a no man had stormed, Fritha left alone in the twilight. So she had done it, he had been told. Suddenly, it was too much even to hold her head up, her gaze falling on the peak of canvas next to her, half pegged out, her bloody handkerchief discarded before it. Slowly, she stooped for the mallet. It did not take any time to find him, eyes that saw better in the half-light than the blazing glare of noon easily catching on that hunched figure, sat cross-legged within the jungle of long grass and staring west, where a sliver of dying sunlight still prevail against the night. A no man. The man did not look round, his voice hoarse and strangely calm. Solafane, there is some problem. No. I merely wished to. A no man cut him off. Do not bother, I know she sent you. Now you are going to assure me she did not mean it, that she just needs time. Eric was right, I should never, no. He sighed, head dropped to his hand, I do not believe that. My place is still here, whatever has happened. I just... Solafane nodded, more to himself than for the night's benefit, a no man's back still to him even as he spoke. It is hard, holding love for a creature which is no longer there, at least not in a form you recognize. When Feyre was first returned after she had been taken to the temple, I hoped beyond all reason she had managed to resist them. That this woman before me, who stalked and sneered was but a facade, a trick for the benefit of matron and handmaiden both. That she was but waiting for their gaze to shift from her and then would reveal herself to me. When Feyre summoned me to her chambers a ten day or so afterwards, I was wary, such caution bred in bone after so long, but even then that ember of hope still clung to life. A no man had turned where he was sat, face etched with a dull misery. What happened? For an instant, Sola Fane was back in that chamber, the woman's back to him as she waited for his departure, their meeting no more than a careless relaying of orders and swift dismissal, as though he did not even mean enough to torment. It was extinguished. And though it was difficult, it was better to be over like that then such hopes drawn out indefinitely, twisting slowly to rancor. She draws it out, a no man muttered, bitterness lost to a long sigh. At first I thought it a game, but I wonder now if she does not just forget herself, falling back into what we once shared. Sola Fane could make no comment to this, the silence holding them a moment and when a no man spoke again, his voice was trembling. She confides in you, Sola Fane, do you believe she truly feels nothing for me? That the man was asking him, the once suspected rival, showed the depth of his desperation. Sola Fane sighed, it would be too cruel to lie to him, though he doubted the truth would serve the man any better. I believe that if Fritha has told you to go, then whatever either of you may feel, it is best you heed her. Even now. Your disappointment turns to hatred. Let it die, a no man. The night turned back to the Golden West. I plan to make my prayers. I will wait if I may. The man said nothing, and Sola Fane sensed he really did not care either way, the drow sinking down in the grass behind him to sit in shared silence, and they remained thus until all the sky was darkness. The camp was set up by the time they returned, all gathered before tents and wagons, two small fires crackling cheerfully, a blackened iron pot bubbling over one. Fritha was already sat with Javach and a few of the other hands, and making merry by all appearances, though his ears could pick up the strained falsity in her laughter. Her smile faltered as she noticed them, 
Solophane catching her eye before Javaj was pressing again for her attentions, and she turned away once more. End of chapter